Hey, we're going to get into a, a really good topic today, and uh, I thought it'd be great to uh, start with and soften it with some scripture. In fact, that would be great to actually start in the Word of God. So, if you've got a Bible, would you open up to First Corinthians? First letter of Corinthians, and uh, let's go just to the first chapter, chapter one. And uh, the place we're going to start is verse four. Why don't, why don't you read it, babe? You've got a lovely voice. Go for I it. I would love to. Um, I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as, e as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I love that our God is coming again. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes. Verse 10, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters. Paul is having a family camp moment yes. with the people of God by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, not some divisions. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Ooh. For some members of Chloe's house have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. The church is the same, it's had quarrels forever and ever. Some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos or other, or I follow Peter or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. Let me, let me hold it there. In fact, I wanna circle back on verse 10 for a second and read it in the NIV. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought, that all of you agree. Today, I want to do a real family camp style conversation. If you're brand new to Vive Church, welcome. Great Sunday. Welcome to camp. We're in camp mode and we're going to converse about some things. And the topic that I wanted us to come around is the topic, we don't agree. Talk about agreement. Let me prepare you. This may be a little pinchy. <laughs> Little pinchy. I've been using that word. We we got tattoos a little while ago, a couple weeks ago now, when the the lady said this may be pinchy. Okay, and it was. And so, <laughs> like a tattoo to your soul, this may be a little pinchy. But I hope you're prepared for it. In fact, last week uh, I was I was talking about the fact that we are connected, and the feeling of connected only comes once you're committed. I also revealed that Karen and I are different. We're different, babe. Yes. So I thought you maybe today could qualify how different we are. We, we are like opposites, like complete opposites. We dress the same, but... We did, you know. we did. We, <laughs> the exterior. Um, you know when you first get married and you think, oh, we love all the same things, we're the same. And then you get married and you're like, who are you? I don't know if I even like I was you. faking just to get you, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I love Michael Bublé. Yeah. I'd go to the concert. <laughs> That's exactly right. So then we discovered how different we are. I mean, my husband is an outdoorsy kind of guy. You love camping. You love being outside. I do not. Give me glamping any day of the week. Where is my, you know, cabana chair and my cocktail? Like, that's... That's me, that's bougie. Rough, isn't it? Yep, that, that's about as rough as it gets. <laughs> I can do the camping, though. But we, um, we have a hard time agreeing. I mean, we agree on a lot now. We agree on so much now. We've been 20 years married, and we agree on a lot of things, on the important things. Um, but, you know, in the early years, we fought about everything and anything, and everything was an argument, and everything was, you know, a moment to win, you know, the conversation, and... Uh, I don't know, we argued about the most ridiculous things. Uh, I can't even remember what we argued about now. But I just remember for the first 10 years, we fought in our marriage until one day we got so tired of fighting that we decided we were tired of fighting and that we would agree to stop fighting. And it was... Our very first agreement. <laughs> it was. 
But it was in that moment we started to develop a framework for having conversations, not to just agree to disagree, but to agree, but within the framework that was healthy. You know, because a lot of us don't fight fair. And I never fought fair in the first 10 years. That's why no, you fought created physical, this not fair. Space, right? That was, yeah, I've just. That's, that's for your protection. Can't kick my shins from there. <laughs> I did it once. But I, isn't it funny? <laughs> Only takes once. Isn't it funny how we can't remember any of the disagreements, we just remember the arguments? Yeah. And then we just decided that we had to stop that. Because God well, had a purpose. Well, we, you know, it's exhausting when you're arguing on the way to church, but you're the pastors, and then you just smile and wave. As God bless you, my brother. God bless it's you. It's so much work. So much work when you're dragging your kids in, and it's like you're a hot mess, and then to pretend like you're put together. It's like, just let's just get on with it and stop having all these arguments before we get to church and let's just deal with stuff and move through stuff. So. Something worked because we would never have been able to agree on moving countries if we couldn't agree on the small stuff That's right. and starting a church. And ultimately, that's what's at stake. See, see, what's at stake is not just winning an argument or losing an argument. What's at stake is the purpose and the plan and the calling of God actually being achieved, whatever the relationship dynamic is, whether it's as a marriage or as a church or even as a friendship. God has a plan. He has a calling. There is something to achieve. And, and your lack of agreement is preventing that purpose coming to fruition. That's exactly why Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. He's writing actually to address the division that was happening within the church. Some division had sprung up. A newly formed community, in fact, that they really didn't have a great framework or an experienced perspective on how to do this thing called the church. However, they were brought into community. And what was forming within the community in Corinth were these divisions or what they say call factions. There was the Ariadite. There was was, uh, those that followed Paul mainly the Gentiles. There were those that followed Apollos because Apollos was a spectacular preacher, apparently. Paul was an, uh, Apollos was an orator and he, he knew how to lay it down. He had bars and some people liked Apollos. There were those that followed Peter because he was mainly, you know, kind of favoring towards the Jews and the Jewish uh, people that were converted to Christianity. And then there were the elitists. Those that followed Christ alone, they weren't going to lower themselves to follow any leader. They were going to follow it was just them and Jesus. And these were four factions that had developed within the church that Paul needed to address so fervently. In fact, in the very opening chapter, in the first few verses of the start of the letter, this is what he decides to go after. A matter of importance. Such a priority for Paul out of all the things he wanted to address. This was preeminent. And he says it this way. He, he invites them to, to remind them that we have to deal with these factions because God has a, a purpose. In fact, it says it in verse 9. It says, God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says. And he has invited you, I love this word, into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in verse 10, he reveals, I want you to be united in mind and thought because of your purpose. The the framework or the premise for why Paul wants us to get along is he wants to reveal that as the community of believers, there is a purpose that God has for us. That God has a plan. That God isn't just bringing you together so that you can be all alike and that you can just be in harmony and sing kumbaya and just, you know, encourage one another and, and bless each other when someone's having a baby, have a meal plan together. That's all good stuff. But there's a bigger purpose in God bringing you together. And so this is important. In fact, he says it with a bit of tongue in cheek. He says in verse 13, has Christ himself been divided? What a funny concept. Has Christ been divided? I know. He's being, he's being, he's asking a a rhetorical question, basically. He's like being cheeky about it. And obviously that answer is no, Christ is not divided. His body is united. But 
the, the deal is that when we as humans get involved with God's plan, we like to take Jesus and bring him into our thing that we like and put his name over that, over our preferences. And that's what these people were doing. They're putting their preference forward for their preachers that they liked. We, we have our interest groups that we like to put Jesus on and that's our preference and that's what we rally around. But Paul is saying, no, no, I want to make sure that you have the purpose of Christ at the forefront. It is him in which the church is saved and sustained. It's only in Him. And so we, in fact, are, it's an inverted approach. We are united in Him. We can be one because He is the church. He's united us as the church. And so it's just a beautiful way of looking at it and unpacking it. Exactly. And, and ultimately what He knew wasn't just divided attention. It was divided allegiance. Mm. They were forming allegiance lines. I followed this and I followed that. And it was dividing the church. And Paul saw it preeminent that we need to discuss this. We need to, we need to actually address the divisions because the divisions are ultimately going to affect our effectiveness as the church. That for what God had called us to do as a community, it requires this thing called unity. That it's our common unity in Christ, the why God brought us together, and for that purpose to be achieved, not just the purpose of the body of Christ at large, but the specific purpose over the specific church that God called you into. And he says, I need you to agree. He's like, would you agree? Not agree to disagree as the world does. I don't know if I could break this to you, but that's not agreement. Like, let's, let's just agree to disagree. That, and, and so that we can move on, there is no progress in disagreement. In fact, disagreement is the point of no progress. Actually, let, let me go a little bit deeper. Disagreement plays into the enemy's plan for division. The enemy's plan is always since creation been to divide and conquer. He tried it with Adam and Eve and he wanted to separate Eve from Adam and Eve from God and Adam from God. And so he knows that nothing he can do can thwart the plan of God except by dividing the people of God. The people of God divided, well, we know this, nothing divided can stand. Nothing divided can stand. It requires unity to be able to withstand and to stand strong and to achieve the purpose of God. So even by saying, hey, let's just, I know we've got some differences, but let's agree to disagree. You're actually solidifying your disagreement. You're entrenching yourself in disagreement. And by saying it's easier to just, uh, no one actually move any ground towards each other. I'm going to hold my battle line. You hold your ground. And we're just going to cement ourselves in disagreement. Therefore, we are rendering ourselves to, to future division and never progressing towards the plan of God. And so Paul, knowing that, and, and very well understanding the purpose and plan that God had for the community, he urges them to agree to be of one mind to be of one heart. So here's the question, and maybe I could help reveal the tension. How, how do we agree as a community of faith when there are so many varying opinions out there? Not even how, but what? What are we meant to agree on and what do we need? To, well, I mean, are there things that we need to agree on and are there things that we don't need to agree on to still be the community of faith? That's, that's a good question. And and it's a, it's a question to be answered at family camp, not really on a Sunday morning. We wouldn't dare do this on a Sunday in church. We, we would only reserve this for family camp, family meeting, and, and, and around a campfire. Because the, the beautiful thing about talking around a campfire, you've got somewhere to look when things get awkward. Just look straight ahead. How do we do this? How do we agree? Well, we've all got different thoughts, different opinions. Maybe the first place to start is what do we need to agree on? Because are there some things that we don't need to agree on and still be in community together? I wonder, I wonder. Just, just brace yourself. Maybe we could start, maybe we could ease into it. Because I don't know if we honestly all need to agree on the US's level of involvement in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I don't think we need to agree and still be in the community because none of us are an authority on the subject. None of us have all the information. 
I mean, by all means, let's move with sympathy and empathy and mercy and kindness and goodness. Let's, let's move with those aspects. But, but we can have varying degrees of agreement on what should be done and still be in community. Would you agree? What about, what about climate change? Like, do we need to all agree on climate change, the reality of it? Do we need to agree on what we should be doing in reducing our carbon footprint? And should we all be doing the same amount? Should, should, do we need to agree on this stuff and still be in community? Or can we just burn fossil fuels and get along? Like, is that possible? Is that possible for a full electric home to get on with a transplant from Texas who's driving a big rig, burning burn fossil fuels, and still be in the community of faith? Can we do that? I think we can. I think we can disagree on the future of the planet and still work out the eternal purpose of Jesus Christ. I believe we can. Crazy. Let's go a little deeper. What about, what about vaccines? Better still, <laughs> what about vaccine mandates? Like, can we actually disagree on the, uh, the efficacy of these things? Because, I mean, let's, let's be honest. Like, look at us. We're sitting in close proximity. Literally, two weeks ago, this was illegal. And none of you all asked your neighbor if they were vaccinated. None of you. But can we agree on, and I mean, it's all, it's all varying on, on your confidence level, your comfort level, and your belief in government. All of these things are varying degrees, but yet I wonder if we can just disagree and still be in community. Can we go deeper? What about sexual identity and the sanctity of marriage being between men and women? Stare at the fire. <laughs> like, can we put that in the camp of vaccines or foreign wars? Or, or is this something that we actually have to agree on if we're going to be effective in what God's called us to as an example of Christ and progenitors of His Word and what God has called us into? I feel like these become things that we do have to agree on. We do have to agree that God has a plan for every single person. We do have to agree that God doesn't make mistakes, that God forms gender, that God forms identity, that when He does something, it's masterful. It's actually masterful. That God's plan for marriage has a purpose to it beyond happiness, beyond pleasure. That God has a distinct purpose for marriage and partnership and the power of a man and a woman coming together to not just multiply, but to multiply faith and to be effective on the earth. I think we need to agree on that, but it's not just agreeing on that, it's agreeing on how we approach the world who don't agree with that. You see, it's not just one agreement, there's multiple levels of agreement. And where a lot of churches have gone wrong, they may have agreed on what's biblical, but they haven't agreed on how to approach the world that aren't biblical. So we need to agree on the approach, not just the information. Can I go a little tougher? Stare at the fire. What about the, the purpose of the church to grow and expand? The mission of the church. You might not think that's tougher, but it is. Because a lot of people have yet to make a transition between I'm just visiting here and what does this church do for me and what does it provide for me and the minute things get tough, peace out, I'm watching from home. But, 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 but miss the fact that God had called you to be a part of the great commission that He missioned and, and He wants to outwork it through the community and we need to agree on the purpose of the church if we're going to actually be in the church. And so there are some things that we need to find agreement on if we're ever going to get our direction right. The direction comes from agreement. And, and I think if we're actually going to get any direction and know out of all the things that we need to agree on or that we can maybe disagree on and still be in the community, I feel like we need to get our direction or build a foundation or a framework from the Word of God. That's the 
That's the thing. If, if the Word of God has some kind of uh, direction on it, then maybe that's the basis for us finding agreement on something. If the Bible doesn't speak about it, then maybe we can disagree. Maybe we can disagree about what to eat and disagree about what to wear and disagree about kinds of music because the Bible maybe doesn't explicitly speak into that, and that's fine. We can still be a part of the purpose and the plan of God. But, but maybe if the Bible speaks about it, that could be the point for us to find agreement to go on the journey and find agreement because we don't even know. Often we're actually informed by, by all kinds of opinions. Well, yeah, and I think that's the, the key component there in our transformation is being informed by the Word and not being informed by the world. And, and that is the reality of even this context and passage of Scripture here where we've, we've got Paul and he's addressing the people because they're bringing their worldly behaviour and world, um, you know, view into the church and they're imposing it on the gospel and it's, being, it's, it's causing these divisions that are taking place. And I think that we do that all the time, even as individuals, when we come into the Word, when we're new in, with reading the Word. You know, I can remember I got saved in my teenage years, so there was a whole lot of the world in me was as I started to read the Word. And when I read the Word, it confronted some things in me. I think, you know, some of us read the Word not to agree with the Word. Um, we, we find the Scriptures that we like and we agree with those. And then the ones that are challenging, we avoid. And, you know, we, we leave that for some other day to unpack. But the Word is there to transform us from the inside out. And so... When we are coming into agreement with the Word of God, we're coming into agreement with the plans of God for our life, understanding that He's the great author and perfecter of our faith, that He has a plan for us, and that, you know, there needs to be a trade-up and a change that takes place sometimes, um, you know, because a lot of us are educated in colleges that, you know, impart a really strong worldview on some things. Uh, some of us have been educated in the law of the land, and, and just because the law says it's okay doesn't mean that this law, the higher law, says it's okay. And so as the people of God, we live by a higher law, a higher standard. And, you know, some of us have even just thought stuff our whole life because someone we trusted, our parents, or someone we, we were mentored by or looked up to, an influencer or whatever, they told us that this is how we should think and this is what we should believe. But it was misinformation and it, wasn't, it doesn't match up with what the Word of God says. And so the trade-up has to happen so that we can come into agreement with what God has for our life and what God wants for our community as the believers. Amazing. And honestly, it's crazy some of the ideas and opinions people have. Not you, but, you know, other people. <laughs> Jacked up ideas that they get from all kinds of influences or information that they've built up over their life and has never been challenged. And, and so often what we do is we... We cement our ideas in, and in the cancel culture of today's society, instead of acknowledging when we're wrong, we will defend a wrong opinion just so that we're not wrong. Just so that we don't lose. However, it's got to be different in the church. In the church, it's got to, it's got to be different. In fact, this isn't just with worldly ideas, it's even with biblical ideas. That's what Bible college does. I went to Bible college. Everything was confronted. Most of my foundation was because dad told me. But dad said it was this way. And then we had to weigh it up against the word of God. And that's what Paul is literally doing. He's asking, can we agree? Can we weigh up our opinions, our ideas, and our thoughts to the word of God? So how do we how do, we do that? How do, how is, is it possible to actually, is it possible for someone to change their mind? Is that even possible like for someone to relinquish their position on something and take up a different opinion it is but it's not easy in fact to to do it it requires nothing less than transformation like you literally have to be transformed for something as deep as a position or an opinion to be changed but the good news is the Bible gives us direction in fact, would you turn with me to Romans 12, 2? I'm going to show you because in Romans 12, verse 2, it says, Don't 
copy the behaviours and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect by changing the way you think. That God's plan for transforming your life is through the means of changing your thoughts, changing the way you think about things, changing the way you approach things. And I want to go ahead and give you three keys that are going to help you change the way you think if you are a willing participant and want to be a part of the plan of God and achieve His grand purpose for your life, here are three things. Go ahead and write these down at family camp. The first thing is you need humility. These are also going to be stingy a little bit, okay? You need humility, a little pinchy. In fact, it says this in in verse 3, following verse 2, it says, uh, because of the privilege and the authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning don't think you're better than you really are. I love how blunt that is. Like, like I, you all have got an elevated perspective of yourself. Uh, you know, a little less Kanye attitude. Like, just be a bit more based in reality for a second. Don't think you're better than you really are. You're good, but you're not that good, okay? And be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. Let me ask a question. Have you ever been humbled in a situation? It's not fun. You ever kind of thought you had the right idea, but you were outnumbered by everybody who had a different thought and you were really severely humbled, like, you know, by realizing you're wrong. Kira loves to do this to me all the time. Like over our marriage, there have been many moments. There was this one time in our early years of marriage where I I went down to where she grew up and there's this place in Australia called Coogee. But I pronounced it Coogee. That's how I thought it was. Like there was G's and E's. And so I just had rolled it. Hey, there's this place I saw at Coogee. And she's like, where? And I'm like, "Uh, Coogee. And she goes, you mean Coogee? I'm like, is that? That sounds weird. Coogee? That's such a dumb name. No, I think it's Coogee. And and she's like, no, it's Coogee. And we had an argument. So she decided to call all the friends that we were going to meet up with and said, hey, when when we get there, like, just say it's Coogee. She set me up. So I I turn up and someone said, oh, I was down in Coogee. And I'm like, ha, it's Coogee. And then they all literally jumped up and laughed in my face. It worked perfectly for Kira. I wasn't humbled. I was humiliated. But let me tell you, that's not the only time you've done it too. Well, if you were humble and accepted when I'm right and you're wrong. Stop stealing my punchline, babe. That's my point. God will give you an opportunity to be humbled. Otherwise, you'll end up humiliated. And you get to choose. By being teachable and open-hearted and open-minded and approachable to the fact that maybe with humility, I don't know everything. And instead of just holding down on my point, I'd rather win the person than the argument. And maybe that there is something I could learn and by approaching each other and coming towards the resolution that there is a humbling process, which is of God, rather than a humiliating process, which is the enemy's plan to humiliate you. That's the first one. It gets worse. Next one is honor. 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 Honor is required for us to find agreement. Honor. Verse 4 goes on to say this, Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of the one body and we all belong to each other. Jump down to verse 9. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good and love each other with a genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. What a great instruction hear from Paul to honour one another. Often we approach honour as if, man, I've just got to do what leadership says because that's the only direction of honour. That's not the only direction. That is a direction. It's an important one. But but the emphasis of this passage and instruction from the apostle is to honour each other, to actually meet with mutual affection, to not firstly think yourself of more highly than you ought, but actually honour the opinions of others and go on an approach to actually be willing to take up an opinion and lay down an opinion. To find agreement. I love that idea that it needs to be sought. That it's almost hidden. That maybe what you know isn't the full knowledge. That maybe there is a journey we need to go on to find agreement. I 
love that. And when you honour God and you love your neighbour, it honours us, like our reputation. It's so powerful. I love that. See, honour is the key ingredient to receiving someone's opinion, to receiving direction, and ultimately to coming into a decision together. It requires honour. You ready for the third one? This is the toughest vital part or a vital component to living in the community of faith and finding agreement. It requires submission. Look at the fire. Submission. <laughs> now, the reason that word's a little pinchy is because it, it is, it's often seen as negative. Because here in the United States of America, we have grown up on way too much WWE, and we know all about the submission move, where you are forced into tapping out of life. Okay, I surrender. But that is not the idea of submission within the church. The idea of biblical submission is an empowering one where I understand that I have a mission, but it is a submission to the great mission. That, that I get an opportunity to bring my mission under our mission. That God has brought us together and He has a mission. God is so good. He has a plan. He has a mission for the church. He also has a mission specifically to you that are connected to your gift set, your skill set, your experience. And all these things work into God working your mission. In fact, when you come to God, there are two things that you get. You get gifts and you get a job. That's what you get. To put it bluntly, God, it's not like you're just meant to be gifted for no reason. We've got too many folk out here in the wider church world just sitting on their gifts like, well, I'm gifted. I don't lift chairs. I, prophes I prophesy. No, you don't. You actually do stuff as well. So God gives you a gift and he, and he gives you a job and that job is all outworked through the community of faith that He places you in by His kindness and His goodness. In fact, God is so kind to you, Vive Church, that He will place you in a community that not only has a potential for you to outwork your purpose, it's cool as well. Like the music's awesome. The pastors are amazing. God loves you. But submission is realising that my mission is subordinate to the overarching mission. Anybody in the military, you would understand that term of subordinate that I'm in a position under, that I'm coming under. I'm coming under and I'm aligned with the authority over me. In fact, I do need to make sure I say this. We're talking about agreement. I need to make sure I get the bearing right. Agreement is not the destination. Agreement is not the end goal here. That's, that could be confusing that the goal of the Christian community is just to come into agreement that we're... We become a happy, clappy, moral club and our whole goal is to just be in kumbaya with each other. So let's not have any feisty debates or any kind of uh, confrontation. Let's, let's just be at peace. And then we're at purpose. No, that's not the goal. Yeah. Agreement is not the destination. It's just a part in the journey. Yeah. It gets us toward the destination, which is the purpose and the plan of God. What is that? Ultimately, for us to walk in our authority. Can I talk about authority for a second? This will, be, this will be helpful because thinking the same isn't the goal. It helps us understand our authority that we have in Christ Jesus. Because ultimately, agreement is way earlier than authority. Agreement gets us to authority. Agreement is what brings us into alignment. And authority always works in alignment. There is no authority outside of alignment. Did you know that? Because authority comes from the author. Jesus is the author of our faith. And as the author of our faith, for us to fulfill the plan that He has for our life, He bestows upon us an authority to enact that plan that He authored. The same way that an ambassador for a country, for a president, has authority to enact and make decisions on behalf of the president and the country, it is always within the directive of the plan from the president. He has authority, but not outside of the plan that is already decided upon. He can sign and He can make decisions, but based within the plan. It's the same with us as believers that God has authored a plan for our life. And with that authorship, He gives us authority to be able to draw on the power and the authority of heaven to extend the kingdom of God, to push back the kingdom of darkness. But that comes only by authority. It comes only by authority. And authority doesn't exist outside of alignment. And alignment doesn't exist outside of agreement. 
You can't be in disagreement and be in alignment. And if you fail to have alignment, you miss the beautiful power of authority that comes from God. Even the protective covering that comes from God. It's, it's a coming up under. We, we love to teach this in School of Leadership. We, we talk about the fact that, 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 that submission is like coming under a covering. Like if it was, if there were the elements, the rain and, and my wife had an umbrella, it would be smart for me to come under that umbrella. I'm under the covering. I'm not losing my identity. I'm not cowering or crawling. I, I choose to come under, but when I'm under, I'm in alignment with the covering and therefore I walk in the protective power of that covering. I agreed to the invitation to come in. It brought me into alignment and I now get to live in the authority that comes with that. See, this is the plan that God has for the church and what Paul wanted the community of faith to know while you're trying to draw dividing lines and allegiance lines, you're missing the fact that God wants to align all the lines. It's not about this guy, that guy. It's about what Christ has in the leadership structure of alignment that He has put in the church so that we can all flourish in authority. So that we can all flourish in authority. So maybe, maybe we don't agree, but Paul says, can we? Maybe the, the base state of our life is we don't agree. But just because we don't agree doesn't mean we can't. Maybe we could go on the journey of agreement. What would it look like for the community of faith to actually put our purpose as more paramount than my preference? What would that look like? Instead of me parading or pushing my preference and the way I like things or the way I think things should be done, what if the purpose of the church was more preeminent than my preferences? That's what Paul is saying. You might prefer Apollos' preaching. You might prefer Peter's preaching. You might prefer this kind of music. There's, everyone's got preferences, but what about our purpose? Can we actually make that the most important thing so that we can be effective as the church, not stalled, not paused, not just getting together every week and singing a few songs and going out in our world and effective, but could we make this effective? Could we make this purposeful? Could we actually begin to take ground off the devil? Could we actually begin to actually make some ground as the church? What would that look like? It requires a deep level of maturity. And what Paul is actually presenting here is like a charge. He's saying, can we, can we do this? I love that challenge. I love it when the Word puts a good challenge in front of you because every time we read it, there's this challenge. Will we apply it? Will we live it? Or will we just leave it there in that space of that was nice. I see that the Word says that. Or will we bring it to life in our community? And that's essentially what Paul was asking and compelling the church. He located them in two ways. There were the Corinthian church. He located them geographically, but he also located them spiritually. He's like, there's some division here, but that's not your future. There's something better on you and you have a reputation beyond that. And so he gives them this charge and he says, for you to fulfill the purpose of God for you as a church, as a body of believers, then I want you to mend the tears in the fabric of our congregational life. And I think every church, if it's full of people, is gonna have divisions and it's gonna have factions. There is no perfect church. But the church that we are, the church that I would love Vive Church to be, would be to be the church that has a reputation for making the effort to mend the things that could be the fractures, that could be the fault lines, that could prevent us from taking kingdom ground, that could keep us stalled. And He says, I want you to do this. So I'm gonna call you to work and pray for healing of the divisions, of our divisions. And He, and he does it because Paul, like his basic concern is that he cares about the wholeness and the integrity of the community. I would like for us to have a reputation as a church, but it also to be felt when people walk in here. Like there is there is an integrity of this community. These people really love each other. They don't stab each other in the back. 
They aren't gossiping and tearing each other down. They are actually building up one another in the Word of God. They're coming around each other. They're each other's allies. They're, they're amening the gift, the spiritual gifts on each other's life. And they're not competing and they're not comparing. They're running together and it's amazing. And so he's, He gives them a charge as a whole, as a community. And you know, often we walk away from church and we get challenged individually, but I'm gonna charge you today as a community of believers that we would be responsible for relinquishing all the rivalry stuff or, or overcoming any divisions that we have in our community. And I'm not asking you to go up to someone and say, you offended me six months ago and you know, da, 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 da. Like that is not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking God to, lo you to allow God to locate your heart today and go, you know what, I need to forgive them. I need to just give that to you, God. I'm gonna be slow to be offended and I'm gonna be quick to forgive. If we could do that as a community, we could change the world. Like I believe that we can be tough skinned like that, that we can advance the Kingdom of Heaven. And so I wanna pray for you right now because I think there's an anointing in this place that as God has revealed stuff in His Word, He is gonna bring it to fruition in our community. And can I mention this baby real quick, just before you say that the, the, the truth is you might think, so what? What does it affect? As my wife just said, the Bible makes it really clear that the world will know I'm real by the way you love each other. Yes. So this has incredible effect in the way that we achieve our mission and the way the world sees the church as the hope of the world. So close your eyes, babe, why don't you pray? Yes, Father, we just thank You. I thank You for this community that You have ordained right here in Palo Alto, but in all our other locations, that the same Spirit flows throughout everywhere we gather, that we are the people of God. We are lovers of You and we are lovers of men and women. And God, I just thank You that You would diffuse any arguments that have raised themselves up to cause division in our community. Would You silence them today, I pray. Lord, would You help us to be able to forgive those who've, you know, hurt and offended us, real hurts and real wounds. Father, we forgive them for they know not what they did. And Father, we just pick up Your will right now and Your purpose. And we declare that we are gonna run towards people. We're not gonna be isolated. We're not gonna have our factions or our favourite groups, but we are gonna move towards each other and love each other. Give us courage. Lord God, I pray to love in the face of hate, to love in the face of, you know, uncomfortableness, to, to be Your church, God. I pray for the authenticity of our house and the reputation to be quantifiable. Let it preach for itself, I pray in Jesus' mighty Name. Amen.